Well, welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're going to have a, a three-header presentation, uh, with each about ten, ten minutes, um, taking through a story, hopefully, of work we've been doing. Um, so, the first part um, brings an overview of the physical system and what we've been looking at, and uh, mostly to do with energy, actually. And so, we look at the system where we have an energy system here, which has primary impacts of chemical, biological, radioactive, and physical, and goes through these transport media, air, water, and earth, and are often transformed as they go through that medium. So, for example, NOx is converted to NO2 gradually. And then we have these targets here. Uh, we're going to focus on human today, but obviously also fauna through acid rain and so forth, and flora and physical. And this kind of process, what we've been looking at is the drivers for energy and agriculture, to a lesser extent, in terms of people and the efficiency of demand, and technology, standards, choice, and use. And those drivers and technologies and fuels determine your emissions. And here we're looking at anthropogenic emissions of nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter, we're not looking at ozone, sulfur, ammonia, carbon dioxide, metals, and so forth. And also we have to look a little bit at natural emissions, particularly of particulate matter, uh, but there's also plenty of others. And those together, through this transformation to where people live, um, such that air, outdoor air pollution is thought to cause about 40,000 premature deaths a year at the moment. The Two pollutants we're looking at, here is NOx, and here is particulate matter, and these are scenarios from DEFRA, and one thing to notice is that the NOx is more concentrated to where it is emitted, whereas the particulate matter is much more widely dispersed, and that is because a large fraction of particulate matter arises as secondary particles which result in the longer term as the air flows through the combination, for example, of ammonia and sulfate ions. Um, and so it's much more dispersed, and indeed a loss of the particulate matter here comes from uh, Europe um, and even China, uh, wider in the Northern Hemisphere. And because of this, when you look at the partitioning of uh, city and external sources, uh, here we have four cities sort of uh, Birmingham, Exeter, Edinburgh and Colchester, you get very different proportions of external emissions affecting concentrations and those which are controlled uh, and emitted within the city. So the calculation process is we calculate base years or collate base year concentrations, we project city and national emissions uh, with models of varying sophistication, then we project the concentration using the changes in emission and we have formula for looking at NOx oxidation to nitrogen dioxide and secondary particulate formation. And then those projected concentrations feed into uh, calculations of premature deaths and years of lost life. So we have developed an energy environment model which we run for cities. And here you see some results for scenarios, draft scenarios for Birmingham. So we put in the drivers of uh, emission basic demands for energy, emission control policies with efficiency standards for vehicles, uh, and uh, switching, particularly in, in cities, to uh, electric transport, heat pumps, and so on. So we're getting less emissions within the city. And here we have it for nitrogen dioxide. And this is road transport in the city. Uh, and these are other city sources, and that's external sources. So that's from power stations and so forth outside the city. So you can see most of the emissions there uh, contributing to concentration are from in the city, whereas PM2.5 is a completely different picture. So you have these uh, national residual and salt emissions, particulates. You have these secondary particles from things like ammonia and sulfate ions combining. And the concentrations arising from city emissions within a city is a very small proportion. So when you look at air pollution health impacts by pollutants and source, you see in the city a very large fraction is from nitrogen dioxide arising from NOx emissions within the city. 
um, whereas uh, particulates and so forth are smaller proportions. And you see, again, this natural and uh, things like salt and uh, weather, weather driven dust and so forth is a large fraction of particle concentration within the city. You should note that we're just lumping all particles together as being the same thing. Of course they're not. A diesel particle is different from a salt particle, is different from uh, other particles. But at the moment our knowledge is insufficient to be able to partition the different effects of different kinds of particles and sizes. And then finally we have here the premature deaths um, controllable by policy. And so this green area here is the fraction of premature deaths which you can control with city policies. So these would be things like electrifying vehicles and heating within the city. Then you have the impacts which are controllable with national policies. So here we would have things like uh, replacing uh, coal and gas generation with renewables to reduce NOx emission. And finally, we have these rather uncontrollable sources of uh, health impact, which are not, uh, can't be controlled either by city or national policy. So as I say, these are sort of preliminary results from running our models for uh, Birmingham and Exeter, where we're, um, basically the main feature is electrification of transport and uh, heating within the city. Thanks. So this is uh, Claire Holman, our air pollution expert, who's working with us uh, on this project. Right. I'm going to be talking a little bit, not about modelling, but about policy. A little bit of a jump from number crunching <coughs> to other things. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about vehicle emissions. Vehicle emissions are the main source of nitrogen dioxide in our cities. Um, vehicle emissions have been controlled in Europe for about 40 years, since the early 1970s. Um, originally under the auspices of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, those emission standards were voluntary. Member states could decide whether or not they adopted them. They were introduced into EU directives. Those directives were about free trade. And they basically said that if those emission standards uh, if a vehicle um, met those emission standards, a member state couldn't ban them from using their roads. So it were, really was not very stringent legislation. Then came the 1990s, and the EU started deciding that they really needed to have much more stringent emission standards on vehicles. Um, in the States, they've had three-way catalysts and petrol cars for many years. We didn't have them in Europe. And so 1992 was the first um, requirement from the end of 1992 um, was the first mandatory requirement. All member states had to make sure that cars first registered after the 31st of December 1992 met certain emission limits. And that resulted in petrol cars having three-way catalysts. There's a few exemptions, so not all vehicles um, had to have three-way catalysts, but it was the start of mandatory emission control. Right about the same time, um, a new approach, so UNECE, it was very much driven by best available technology as defined by the motor industry. The European Commission thought we need a new way of looking at this. So what we need to do is we need to look at what we would call environmental capacity. So how much emissions can the environment cope with? So you set your air quality limits, i.e. the limits that are required to protect human health and also nature conservation, but I'm going to focus on human health. Um, and then you work your way backwards. You forecast future emissions. You know where you want to get in terms of air quality. You then work out how much you have to reduce emissions. And then you look at, you do a cost effectiveness study, look at a whole range of different measures, and identify those package of measures that will be the cheapest way of meeting your target. And, and Mark did a lot of modeling for this, particularly on the cost effectiveness side of the study. There were two auto oil programmes, and we worked on both of them. The first one really involved the European Commission, the oil industry and the motor industry, a very small select group. We developed a lot of new methodologies for doing this sort of work. And the end product was a number of um, EU directives, new emission limits for vehicles, new fuel quality standards, Roadworthiness test. The roadworthiness test made no difference in the UK because we've had our MOT test for so long, but men, many member states had no roadworthiness test. 
So that was testing emissions on a regular basis. They then decided, everybody thought, oh, this is brilliant, this approach. It was really scientific, great, robust, um, systematic approach to setting new, new environmental standards. And so they had a second um, program, uh, much wider participation. Everybody wanted to be involved, which meant that many parts of the European Commission wanted to be involved, and all the various NGOs, and so many people wanted to be involved in the second pro program that actually it delivered not very much. At the same time as this was going on, they were also setting up new air quality limit values. So there was a directive in 1996, which was a framework directive on air quality, um, and then there were a series of daughter directives under that. So in terms of nitrogen dioxide, the first um, uh, limit value was 40 micrograms a cubic metre. Don't expect you to remember the number. Um, and as an annual mean, that was to be achieved by 2010. Now let me go to the next Slide. Ooh, what happened? Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Ah, oh, help. Um, keep going, keep going. Uh, put the laptop. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. There we go. So what did I press Don't press that one. <laughs> Just press the fourth back. That was a, such a typical woman response, wasn't it? No! No, when a man was on... Uh, so, we're now doing <laughs> <laughs> We're not very PC, are we? <laughs> We're now zooming forward to 2016. And with, this is, in the UK, we have, we have the EU limit values, but we also have some national legislation which requires, the Environment Act 1995 required local authorities to review and, air, uh, review and assess air quality within their boundaries on a regular basis. And there's national, what we call air quality objectives, which have the same values as the EU directive. Again, 40 micrograms of cubic meters and annual average for NO2. If you exceed those objectives, you have to declare an air quality management area and then you have to have an air quality action plan. So this shows the number of local authorities, 289 local authorities in the UK. Two thirds of them have an air quality management area. So even though we're talking about in 1990s, all this wonderful way of setting new policies and stuff, you wonder why so many, people, so many local authorities have had to declare air quality management areas. Most of them from nitrogen dioxide. So there are 613 air quality management areas in the UK for nitrogen dioxide. Significantly less for PM, few for uh, sulfur dioxide. And this is the sources of them. Green is road transport. So nitrogen dioxide, Road transport, road transport for PM. Uh, some dioxide is mainly industrial, so the blue is, is, is industrial. So we're now going back to the directive. So the directive was revised in 2008. They realised the, how much difficulty it was to get to the um, limit value by 2010. So they revised it and allowed um, member states to apply for a time extension of up to five years which would take us from 2010 to 2015. Obviously, 2015 is gone now. Um, so um, there's a, an interesting um, environmental pressure group called Client Earth who are l lawyers. Um, and it's quite unusual that the legal system has been used to advance environmental protection in the UK. Um, and they took the UK government to court um, for their 2011 air quality plan. So the directive requires you to have a plan to say how you're going to make the limit values. It went all the way up, it went, it went to the High Court, went to Strasbourg, came back, um, ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, ordered DEFRA to produce a new air quality plan, which it did in December of last year. So then Kyan Earth this, looked at the new air quality plan and decided that wasn't any good either. And I had the privilege of being asked to be their expert witness in that case. And we were successful in actually um, declaring that plan illegal, i.e. non-compliant with the EU directive. And this is what the judge said on the 2nd of November, so this is very, very recent. Um, that, that they basically didn't follow the relevant article because the Secretary of State must aim to achieve compliance by the soonest date possible. Um, basically, they said that uh, compliance would happen in 2020, in 2025, no, 2020 outside London and 2025 inside London. Our argument was they could have done it quicker. Um, needs to choose a route 
which reduces exposure as quickly as possible. And she must take steps that mean meeting the limit values is not just possible, but likely. And, and my role in the case was to say, well, actually, their modelling was a load of rubbish. And we never expected the judge to agree. Well, I didn't expect the judge to agree with me, but he did, basically. He reckoned that they, 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 were, in, they, they, they were in error for using too optimistic modelling projections. So that's this point here. Then he said at the end, this is his um, judgment, it would be appropriate to make a declaration that the air quality plan fails with, to comply with Article 23 and Regulation 26 of the national legislation and an order quashing the plan. Well, actually, Client Earth didn't want an order quashing the plan. So before this judgment came out, um, DEFRA had already consulted on clean air zones. So they started their consultations on the framework of clean air zones. So the 2015 plan said that the five cities outside London would need to have mandatory clean air zones where they'd have to charge for certain vehicles to enter within those zones. And that consultation started before this came out. We didn't want DEFRA to go away and not do anything for months and months and months. So we didn't actually want it to quash. So a couple of weeks later, uh, oh, three weeks later almost, that, um, this was the order that they, the judge came up with. Basically, that they, wouldn't, they would have to amend the plan, i.e. not quash the existing plan, but amend it. They had to have an, a draft new plan by the 24th of April next year and the final plan by the 31st of July. Um, and also that um, Client Earth will have access to all the technical details behind the development of the plan, because one of our frustrations was it was very opaque as to um, how they had actually modelled quite a lot. One of the amusing things was that in the, the, the hearing when the order was made was that the QC for DEFRA stood up and said, we can't do it before September because everybody's on holiday in August. <laughs> and um, the judge says, I will give absolutely no weight to that argument whatsoever. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So that's why the 31st of July. Um, one more slide. Um, and this is the lead on to Paul's um, presentation. This is looking at motor of, um, emissions of NOx from different types of vehicles. So Euro 3 at the top, Euro 6. Euro 3 was introduced in 2000, Euro 6 in 2014. Petrol on the left, diesel on the right. Um, what you can see is that the difference, the light blue is the emission limit, the dark blue is on-road, real-world driving emissions results, averages. And you can see on the petrol that the difference between the emission limit and the real-world emissions is much smaller than it is for the diesel vehicles on this side. You'll also notice that this blue number is always big. So this is the limit value. It's always higher for diesel. So not only do they perform badly in the real world compared to the limit value, but they're also the limit value is much higher than it is for petrol. So on that note, I shall... So introduce the economist Paul Drummond. <coughs> OK, so um, I'll move on from that and talk about um, existing... EU plans to increase their increase real world compliance from diesel cars with the actual um, with the actual legal values. So at present, real world emissions NOx emissions from diesel cars exceed reported values. So the actual 80 milligrams per kilometre for NOx um, by up to 15 times for some vehicles. On average, about five to six times on average. Um, petrol cars, as Claire says, are largely compliant with the regulations in their real world emissions. So to finally prove this, the testing methodology the EU employs uh, will be replaced in September 2017 with what's called the real driving emissions testing. However, conformity factors will be applied. So this means that although the legal limit for Euro 6 diesel cars, Euro 6 is the class currently sold, is 80 milligrams of NOx per kilometre, from 2017 September, any new models, and from September 2019, all new diesel cars, will be allowed to exceed that value in real-world emissions by 2.1 times. That will then reduce to, in 2020 and 2021, to 1.5 times the limit. So that will mean that in 2021, diesel cars will be permitted to emit NOx at a rate double that of existing petrol cars. So this means that further action to tackle NOx emissions from diesel cars is required and justified. So in the UK, I'll look at four broad options for taxation to try and tackle that. 
to complement the EU, um, EU level regulation. The first is the possible use of a supplementary NOx tax on diesel fuel. So there is one immediate problem with this, is that a tax on fuel for diesel cannot directly uh, um, address the externality of the NOx emissions uh, unlike a, with a price, unlike CO2. So CO2, for example, a unit of petrol or diesel will produce the same amount of CO2 regardless of how, when, or where it's emitted. And that will then cause the same level of social cost regardless of where it's emitted, how, or, or when. NOx, however, the actual level of NOx emissions generated by the combustion of diesel fuel, or any other fuel, depends on circumstance. It depends on the engine it's combusted in, any external conditions including temperature, and any presence of tailpipe technologies that might remove any NOx from the, the exhaust uh, gases. In addition, the damage cost, the marginal damage costs, which is the additional cost to society of the emission of a unit of NOx, will vary in time and space. So the emission of NOx in a crowded city in the middle of rush hour will cause a lot more damage to human health than if the same units of NOx was emitted in the middle of the countryside, for example. But if you were going to try and put a, a tax on diesel fuel to try and tackle the NOx emissions from, uh, from diesel cars, one way of doing it would be to try and calculate the average additional cost um, of a unit of diesel combusted compared to a unit of petrol combusted in a petrol car. And we calculated this value using DEFRA published damage costs for NOx at 19 pence per litre of fuel. However, this might not be particularly effective. So this graph shows the evolution of petrol and diesel prices in the UK from 2000 to about April this year. And we can see that from between 2009 and 2012, petrol and diesel prices roughly raised in tandem by about 50 pence per litre. And from that, we didn't see a particular shift uh, from diesel or petrol cars to alternative cars or modes. Um, and so there's no reason to expect, particularly in the short term, that a, uh, a 19 pence tax on diesel fuel would, um, would stimulate such a move. However, it would provide a particular differential with, between diesel and petrol prices. However, at 19 pence, diesel would still produce a lower cost per mile of fuel than petrol. And also the evidence suggests that fuel price changes are only considered by consumers by about three years in the future. So the actual the incentive would be limited over time. It's also very politically difficult to try and do so. So a 19 pence increase in a diesel fuel tax would represent an increase in fuel duty of 33% which itself has been frozen since 2011 and was announced it will continue to be frozen in the recent autumn, sta uh, autumn statement. In addition, it might be regressive amongst car-owning households, uh, particularly rural households, where the poorer section of society would end up bearing a higher cost than the more wealthy. So that's the uh, tax on diesel fuel option. <coughs> Second option is a supplementary NOx-based registration tax, so a tax you would pay either when a car is registered or when it's first purchased. Evidence suggests that such taxes are generally quite effective in influencing purchasing, uh, purchasing behaviour, and it's been commonly applied in the UK and in the EU and elsewhere with regard to CO2 emissions, the example in the UK being the, the excise duty, particularly the first year rate, which was recently reformed this year to be even stronger. Um, although such tax can't influence emissions from existing vehicles, it can only influence emissions from new vehicles purchased, and it can't address when or where such emissions occur. So to try and calculate an optimal rate for what you should try and um, introduce for such a tax, it should be the net present value of the marginal NOx damage costs over the lifetime of the vehicle. Essentially looking at the total damage costs an average vehicle would cause over its lifetime set in current value um, against the comparator. And so here we calculated four different rows, four different columns for options for how you could calculate that. These rows here, these columns, this row, sorry, this column here, these are grades borrowed from emissions analytics, which run an index of real-world test results of diesel cars uh, called the EQUA index, and they use this grading system here for reasons which we can talk about later. Um, so any car should, any diesel car sold in the EU should currently meet grades A star and A. At present, it roughly looks like that in terms of market share. So only about 10% of the vehicles on the market. Um, meets those gradings, the average vehicle sold in the EU is roughly in grade E. So looking at these four options here, so option one, option one compares the additional damage cost of a vehicle falling into these rows down here 
uh, compared to the compared to a diesel car that does meet the Euro 6 regulation of 18 mg uh, per kilometre. Uh, option 2 does the same calculation but compares it to a petrol car with a lower limit value of 60 mg. Um, these two options both assume that diesel cars and petrol cars drive the same average annual mileage of about 8,000 miles per year. However, in fact, diesel cars and petrol cars tend to travel different average distances per year. For petrol, it's roughly 7,000 miles per year. For diesel cars, it's roughly 12,000 miles per year. So option three and four repeat these calculations, but taking that difference into uh, its consideration. So we can see that if we were to implement such a tax, um, the average car sold today, average diesel car, would have a tax imposed of roughly, depending on the option, 1,100 pounds to about 1,700 pounds. So the problem comes if this is trying to be introduced prior to the introduction of the real-world emissions testing in 20, uh, 2019. Um, if it was introduced at that time, the test results for those vehicles could be used to grade each car into these different grades of A star to H. If it's to be introduced before that, there are a couple of options that could be used to try and determine the grading for each individual car. The first is to use the EQUA index data, which, um, from which this grading is initially um, borrowed from. That data is nearly but not quite comprehensive. Also, it's uh, data produced by one firm using one methodology, so it could be open to um, contest. Another option is to use a default grade into which every vehicle would be assigned, unless it can prove using independent data that it should be assigned to another grade that's preferential. So to provide the greatest incentive for that, grade H would be the obvious one to use. So charging vehicles between uh, £3,500 and £5,000 upon purchase. Um, but that may not be potentially politically that feasible. So given that only 15% of vehicles are above that, it could be suitable to simply apply the grade E as the default uh, level, particularly since grades F to H will be removed from the market, supposedly from 2017, uh, 2019. Third option is the use of a supplementary NOx circulation tax. So this is essentially a tax you pay annually for ownership of a car. And the optimal rate to levy for this would be the average marginal damage costs in a single year, as opposed to the entire lifetime of the, uh, lifetime of the vehicle, against the comparator. So it's a very similar calculation. Essentially, it's just the calculation of the additional damage costs for a given year for a given vehicle in these grades. And you can see the values are much lower. So the same issues of data availability and reliability are present, and the same solutions can be applied. However, However, compared to registration taxes, annual circulation taxes aren't as effective. People don't consider the value of a £100 tax in five years' time in the same way as a £100 tax paid immediately. Okay, the fourth option is road pricing. So zonal-based road pricing, for example, the London congestion charge, uh, can more, effect more effectively influence spatio-temporal characteristics of emissions, so where and when emissions are created. Uh, so the congestion charge in London has been generally successful in reducing congestion and encouraging a switch from private to public transport in greater London, in central London, and it has had an influence indirectly in driving NOx emissions weekly downwards. Um, the ultra-low emission zone, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, will be introduced in London in 2019 or 2020, it's yet to be fully decided, and that will charge pre-Euro 6 uh, vehicles, cars, and pre-Euro 4 petrol cars, which is the same rate as 80 milligrams of NOx per kilometre, um, £12.50 a day to enter the zone. The zone will be the same, uh, either, either the same as the current congestion charge zone, or will extend to the north and south circulars, depending on the final design. But the key point here is that Euro 6 diesel cars are exempt from the charge. So here's a potential way of, um, of solving that problem, to including Euro 6 cars. So, if it's to be introduced in 2019 or 2020, real uh, driving emission testing will be in place by then. That testing could be used to assign the Euro 6 vehicles to different categories based on the same, here we've used the same grading system as uh, EQUA and the previous instruments discussed. There could be three example categories. The, one could be, the first one could be exempt, so as currently planned, Euro 6 di uh, diesel cars could pay no extra fee for entering the zone. Um, but that would mean these cars do meet the regulated limit in real-world emissions. It could be then further two categories. So ones that's vehicles that are going to grades B to E, for example, 
So including the average car currently sold, uh, would pay perhaps five pounds, which is a rate, the rate the congestion charge initially charged. And the worst vehicles sold or on the roads can, be, can pay the full, the full whack, same as any pre-Euro 6 car. This approach could be applied to other proposed clean air zones. So clean air zones are proposed to be applied, I think, to five, currently five cities around England uh, to try and tackle NOx emissions in those, in those areas. And they currently plan to exempt all passenger cars of any vintage from their design, which may have to change in current plans that um, Claire, that Claire described. So overall, our recommendations would be to use as a primary instrument a supplementary NOx registration tax for diesel cars, um, given the advantages that has over a circulation tax, for example, and a fuel tax. That may be introduced alongside the CO2-based vehicle excise duty, so that maintains both the CO2 price signal and the NOx price signal to try and encourage both low CO2 and low NOx vehicles and a switch to um, other modes of transport. The secondary instrument to be applied alongside that at the city level is road pricing for diesel cars, as I just described for the new in London and the cleaner zones across England, and potentially more cities, depending on future plans. So such a combination would discourage the purchase of new NOx-intensive diesel cars. It would discourage NOx emissions from all diesel cars, both, both new and existing, in areas where damage costs are greatest, i.e. cities. The risk of regressive taxation is reduced, so in this combination, the owners of existing diesel cars driven in rural areas are largely unaffected, and each option generates additional revenue, which then may be used to further the environmental objective, um, such as using it to invest in low emission public transport or active transport infrastructure, which has other co-benefits of tackling, for example, congestion or uh, other public health objectives like obesity. So thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. That's our presentation finished. Uh, okay. Any questions? Well, what we normally do uh, at this stage is just is take questions, uh, and uh, I assume that all three of you are happy to uh, 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 answer questions. Fantastic. Um, just before we kick that off, uh, I want to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, which is to say that if there is a fire alarm, it's real, and we should exit the uh, room. A little late, but, but nothing has happened yet, so it's still a useful thing to say on times. Uh, on times, um, we will uh, do uh, questions and answers until about half past six, uh, and then we will move uh, upstairs, those of you who wish to, um, for uh, a small reception, drinks and nibbles uh, in the Energy Institute kitchen. So you're pretty welcome to join us at that point. Um, so, can we have the first question, please? Okay, yes, I can see you now. Um, uh, if you give your name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm Melissa Lund, here at UCL, um, here. Uh, so, question on the very beginning, so Mark, when you were talking about the model, um, I, I'm sorry I missed the name of it, and the follow-up questions, depending on the name and how familiar I am with it, is how did you calculate out these debts? The so yeah. How do we calculate the steps? Presumably there's all this um, yeah, and the, the, the model we're developing is for is an innovative, innovate funded project, which we're doing with the Energy Saving Trust. And the idea is to develop actually a commercial model, okay. which local authorities will use. So we're working with Birmingham and Exeter, the first two cities. So that's the model. And here at UCL, uh, we're responsible for collating all the data apart from for the domestic sector, for emissions. emissions and so on and for developing the model algorithms. And so the, um, the model, which will be commercialized, is called SciSets, but we have a, a sort of toy model here called C-City. Um, and the procedure is we take base year concentrations of pollutants from DEFRA, which are given by kilometer grid square uh, across the UK. And um, we operate on average concentrations. So we take the average concentrations of NO2 and PM2.5 for the base years. Then, uh, and that's split down by source for each kilometer square, whether it's city road transport, city industry, and external, rural, and secondary particles. 
And then we have emissions projections, partly based on national energy modelling for the emissions of NOx, uh, sulfur dioxide, and so forth. We don't model uh, ammonia emissions, so they're taken <coughs> as projected, but those are usually almost flat anyway. We have looked at the uh, forecasting of secondary particles using work uh, based on work done by uh, EASA and by Imperial College. Um, and then we project primary emissions, emissions of primary particles. And then we have the emissions of NOx inside and outside the city from our energy modeling and transport modeling. And then we calculate the, the oxidation of the NOx to NO2 <coughs> using equations from uh, Ricardo AEA. Um, and so then we can, uh, taking the base year concentrations using these emissions in indices and the calculations of secondary particles and so on, we can come up with projections of concentrations within the city arising from internal and external emissions. And then we put into that, in the city model, <coughs> we have, if you see the emission curves going down, we have assumptions in there about the, uh, the proportions of diesel and electric vehicles and so forth, the number of passenger and tonne kilometers, uh, the transport demand, space heating demand given in insulation and so forth, partition of space heating demand to gas boilers and electric heat pumps and district heating. Uh, and so we use those energy policies to come up with the total concentrations of... Can I just check, was your question related to deaths? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so you, sorry. You, sorry. You, and then the last part... Is it panel surveys and like knowing people's patterns when they in the city? Is it the, just, we is have, we, we use transport uh, vehicle data, okay. which again is given for each uh, road link within the city. Yes. And then we process that, we have assumed load factors, so we can work out passenger kilometers and tonne kilometers from those data. And where do you put the people? Where do you bring them in? Sorry, where do so we I'm put trying people? to figure out, so you calculate deaths. And we, have thin, we have the city population, yeah. and we have the city uh, mortality rate is given by ONS, the uh, ONS statistics. So that gives us our base mortality rate. And then we use the standard uh, concentration response for, uh, oh, relationships yeah. to work out the changes in mortality. Okay, I think I'll just follow up with you after. I'm worried, so when we do London, because I live in London, y'all did a bunch of other cities, and we look at how people move through the city because so many people come here that don't live here. So the population statistics don't make account for that. So we should just chat about it. I'm just curious how y'all account for that. And so exposure also, depending on how far you go in, if I'm walking down this road outside versus even two roads in on UCS campus, my exposure would be quite the, the model we so use is a linear model with no thresholds. And so we think, therefore, we can use the average concentration across the city with the average population in the city. Okay, city. If you assume thresholds and non-linearity, then you have to go down to spatial Finer spatial and temporal resolution. So you're doing average over a year and just population, so where we live, so based on that. That's right. And cars based on registration? No, the the no, so the emissions from cars are based on the traffic data okay. within the city. Okay. So it doesn't matter really where they where they originate outside or inside the city. We can chat about that. Yeah. So, sure. so linearization is the great simplification <coughs> which really makes it possible to do this without knowing where the people are precisely. Yes. Although yeah. okay. you know I have to say that actually the epidemiological basis for air pollution health impacts actually it very often assumes uh, averages rather than peaks and Paul. Yeah Paul Eakins I so <coughs> question for each of the other two speakers. Um, in your discussions with Planet Earth, have there been any thoughts of taking a class action against the government for failing to meet laws that are designed to stop people dying early? So that's sort of first question. And, and to Paul, um, I mean, clearly this is not a problem either of London or the UK only. It's a very wide European problem. And most European mm -hmm. cities, as I understand it, are in violation of these EU regulations. These four tax options, in which obviously I'm very interested, um, are they being used anywhere in the EU in order to uh, seek to gain compliance or get near compliance? Or are we, with our congestion charge, which is still pretty unusual in the EU, uh, actually sort of near the cutting edge of what's being done? Shall I go first? Sure. 
Um, I don't think client earth is, but I have been approached by a firm of solicitors who are very interested. Ah, okay. And just very interested, or are they close to doing things? He just told me I need to stand up. <laughs> um, well, um, it's very much an early stage. I mean, they're looking at the evidence. Um, we're, 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 we're waiting for COMI, the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollution, to come up with their most recent report, which was due out in June. It's now due out maybe before Christmas, maybe after Christmas, which is quantifying the health impacts of NO2 in the UK. So until that's out, we're sort of a bit in limbo. We'll see how it comes. I'm not aware in the EU or anywhere else of anyone applying tax options to try and tackle NOx explicitly. There have been, well, Madrid and Paris recently announced they would ban diesel cars entirely from 2025 from their city centres. Um, others have said they're going to ban diesel from sale completely. But I'm not aware of anywhere that's trying to use tax, shop, tax options for NOx at the moment. So I think it would be quite a, a new approach for NOx at least, not for CO2 obviously, but for NOx it would be. Can I just add something? Not to, not to the economic side, which I know, Paul, is your main interest, but um, the client Earth, it's not just the client Earth taking these legal actions in the UK, um, there's been a number of actions being taken, including in Brussels, which is quite ironic, really, but one of them was in Germany, and the court in, I think it was Dortmund, but I might be wrong about that, um, has actually said they've got to ban diesel cars. So, which is quite an interesting for a court to come up and say ban diesel cars. Can I have a supplementary? I mean, does this imply that, that the regulatory approach, i.e. You know, banning and, and all that, is likely to be more effective than the taxation approach? Well, it would be effective in simply that you've removed what you're trying to incentivise against. So it would be, I suppose, inherently more effective unless you have given, unless you have certain derogations from that. Uh, but on the face of it, it would be more effective. The, the main problem I see from that is political feasibility from simply banning. So I think it would be that using a taxation option first would then move the kind of window of opportunity towards banning. So I think that's where the advantage comes in for the tax option. Yeah, Paris already said it's going to ban. And they've already said they're going to ban, yeah. yeah. Mm, but when you look in the detail, is it really a ban? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Kieran. I'm from the sustainability team in the UCL States, the Green UCL. Um, we're currently putting together uh, an institutional response to the current consultation on the future of the ultra low emission zone, um, which is open to be in December. Um, so I wonder if you had any thoughts on uh, what the best option for the future of that is, so either to uh, expand it to inner London or London-wide, uh, and also whether, given that uh, Euro 6 diesel cars are currently exempt, whether there will be any move to include them uh, or uh, to include them, or whether there's any thought given to the kind of uh, scrappage scheme, so the, the sort of economically progressive argument that the poorer people have the oldest cars, and particularly with people having been encouraged by diesel cars of recent models, whether there's any uh, means to encourage people to get rid of them. Yeah. So I think it would be, given the level of pollution in London, it would be better to expand it from the congestion charge zone only to be the north and south circular roads to be much more holistic, otherwise there's the risk of um, cars simply circling around and not going in but having other options to pollute in other areas. So I think to, to expand it further would be send a much stronger signal earlier on. I think in terms of um, including Euro 6, I, I think it would be more, much more feasible if it was a central London <coughs> only thing. I think to expand it out further than that for Euro 6 would be much more difficult because obviously it has much more much wider implications in terms of people having to uh, become compliant with their vehicles or not or pay, or pay the charge. Um, with the scrappage scheme, scrappage scheme, uh, well, what they're trying to do is trying to lobby government to have it as a national scheme because they can't, uh, they can't really do it too well in London alone because there's potential for gaming and other issues to do with budget. Um, I don't particularly think the scrappage scheme is a great idea. I think there's other ways you can use the money because you'd have to use uh, revenue raised from another, another source. I think that money is better used in other ways, particularly using investing in public and active transport, so walking and cycling. Um, and also, I, I think that I can't back this up directly with evidence right now, but I would imagine that um, so a decent sort of scrappage scheme doesn't necessarily favour the least, the worst off, because to do that, yes, you're selling, you're scrapping your old car you do have to buy a new car. 
So that would be much more expensive than buying a second-hand car, which is what often happens. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not, and it also doesn't, there's evidence to suggest it doesn't really have any additional environmental benefits, and it can have a perverse incentive. Paul, can, can yeah. I just start asking a question on this? Um, uh, would a combination of scrappage uh, and uh, congestion charge uh, be appropriate? If the scrappage um, uh, uh, was uh, only covered part of the cost of a new car, mm. uh, you could decide to not scrap your diesel car if you live in the sticks, but if you happen to uh, be subject to the congestion charge, then you might decide to accept a partial scrappage op option um, uh, and scrap early. So it's partial scrappage in terms of you scrap your car and your, then receive... Your, the, the, the scrappage scheme would only pay part of the cost of scrapping the diesel car and replacing the petrol car. You mean the congestion, the tax would pay for the part of the cost? The, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, but again, I think I think the best focus, particularly in places like London or other big dense cities, yes. isn't to invest in replacing a private car for yet another private car. I think the better longer term option would be to invest in public transport and active transport infrastructure. May I just, can or, I just interfere? Yes, um, I would just say that there, you know, there is an issue of timing here because we're talking about a large number of people having premature deaths as a result of air, poor air quality. So to me, you want to get these measures in as quickly as possible, which is why ultimately you know, things like electric vehicles will clean up the cities. But the time it will take to do things like that, for, it, for the fleet to turn over and for there to be a significant number of electric vehicles in the fleet, is just too long. 1% of new cars are electric at the moment. Um, maybe it would take 15 years. I mean, certainly the government's aim is by 2030 that all new cars should be electric. We can't wait till 2030. We want to solve this problem. Well, it should have been solved um, by 2010. Then they've got time extension in 2015, but it needs to be so solved as quickly as possible. And I think you need to have that time element into the discussion about what measures are appropriate. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's a really <laughs> okay, yes, I can take the lady here. Yes. Um, sorry, uh, this might be a naive question, but I recently read that uh, when we say that there are, say, 40,000 deaths due to air pollution in UK, these are attributable deaths, basically. Uh, applying to the population as a whole and not um, correspond to individual deaths, which can be accounted like which can be accounted for by pollution. And I'm not saying that it's not does not mean that the pollution is a serious problem because we are losing life expectancy of many more number of people. But uh, I just wanted to clarify that whether yes, it it's, it's it's not that forty thousand people die and all the others. It's a purely statistical thing because the epidemiological base for these estimates are very crude, actually, uh, and there's so many synergies involved. Uh, it's, it's not just NOx, it's also PM and uh, other, other forms of uh, air pollution. So um, it's purely a statistical measure, and um, the estimates of the impacts of the different pollutants vary from year to year, actually. So, for example, we haven't looked at carbon monoxide or ozone, which also contribute to ill health. And it's not just loss of life expectancy, it's also more visits to hospital and uh, a whole multitude of health impacts. If I can add to that just real quick, on it, when you talk about particulate matter, not one of the, there's a big confusion, as Mark just said, around um, when you take just one of those, particulate matter, we're feeling pretty good about our evidence. But when you take NOx into it, we've got big uncertainty virus about I mean, I think the King's College did this big report for London, and even they say we're going to do a 30% ban because we're just really not sure. Yeah. And there's quite a bit of controversy over whether that's even yeah. a big enough ban. Yeah. But bottom line it is, we know that pollution hurts us, so let's and, not have it. And so yeah. it's a Melissa. Yeah. And one of the things that Melissa says is that you have the impact due to nitrogen dioxide, and you have the impact due to PM, you know, small particles. If you have the two together, what's the synergy between them? 30% reduction, in, it's actually a very flaky concept. Um, so it's just, you know, the estimates on something extremely complex. So, uh, okay, yes, please, if you want to. Yeah, yeah sure. Hi, uh, I'm Ed. Um, there seems to be a lot of focus on diesel and within transport specifically. Um, have you had any thought around standby diesel generators? <laughs> Fighting backup power to hospitals, things like this. 
they are a real problem, not in terms, not in terms of the um, annual mean natural and dark side limit value, but in, there's two limit values. One's a short-term one for one hour, and you know I've, I've seen a lot of air quality assessments of these new um, generating capacity. That okay, they're, they're not operating very long, but when you're talking about one hour, the concentration limit is 200 micrograms per cubic meter that you're allowed to exceed 18 times in a year. I've seen calculations which show that the 19th hour, instead of being 200, is 1,500. So you actually got very localized, very high concentration for, for short periods of time. And I think it's a big issue. There is a consultation out from DEFRA at the moment on what the medium combustion plant directive, which will include those, um, which I've not looked at. But um, I think it's a big issue. I understand that the hospitals are exempt from that. Uh, standby but just to add that, I mean, there's a huge capacity of diesel generation, maybe 20 gigawatts. Uh, we don't really know. Most of the additional diesel capacity for the capacity problem that we're facing is in diesel farms, which will be outside of populated areas. And as far as we know, like a diesel generator in the hospital is not run. It's run in emergency times. It's not, a gen not in general use. So I, I would say, in the scheme of things, it's probably a tiny, tiny but part. But it does. This short-term stuff, though, uh, it does exceed the limit value. Short-term uh, uh, That's, not, that's not to say it, it doesn't have short-term big impacts, but probably limits <coughs> in terms can, of can, population. Can I say perhaps the linearization assumption? You can't uh, use that. You can't use that. I know. <laughs> there's, there's no, we're not we're only looking no. at the long term. We're not looking at these short term. There's obviously a point at which... Um, you know, your probability of dying with a high enough NO2 or PM concentration is 100%, you're just going to die. But the fraction of total health impacts from these episode, local episodes is probably quite small, but it may be quite high um, if you're getting, uh, you know, long-term episodes in a city with temperature inversions and so on, then you do see an increase in hospital admissions, for example, in response to those episodes. I, I get the impression that there are lots of people who want to ask questions. I'm prepared to let this run on for another 10 minutes or so, if, if that's okay with you. So, uh, next question, please. Yes, at the back. I'm uh, Duncan. I'm uh, doing one of the master's courses here uh, in the Energy Institute. Um, I was just wondering about making uh, diesel engines at the sort of stigma that smoking was in the <laughs> early part of this, well, the 2000s essentially. Because it seems to me that a lot of people back then wouldn't have realised that maybe in a decade's time you would, you would hardly come in, as a non-smoker, you'd hardly come into contact with people smoking. And whether, you, whether it's right or wrong to do that, it seems like it can be done quite quickly. So I was just wondering if there's an opportunity, because people talking about diesel engines often say, oh, well, the driving's better, the, 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 the cost of the fuel is lower per mile or whatever, but is there an opportunity to sort of inject some sort of, well, it's also very dangerous to people into that somehow? Is there a way of doing that using smoking as an example? Uh, well, I think it is becoming, people are becoming more aware of the dangers of air pollution in general and from cars and diesel cars in particular. I'm not sure it would be particularly helpful to try and make it an, an analogy with smoking because smoking is a personal choice you can stop immediately, it has no other only, only positive impacts. With a driving a car you may not have any other choice, you may have a diesel car and simply have to take your kids to school. You, so I think stigmatising those people that have a diesel car that would need help to replace the function that provides, I think, I'm not sure that would be particularly helpful. But I think overall, I think people are starting to realise that air pollution and the causes of them is, is becoming more present in the public psyche, I think. More questions? Yes. Uh, as a citizen or an activist... Let me start with your name, please. Oh, I'm Ruben. I'm an architect. Um, <laughs> as, um, as an activist or a citizen, is there anything that people can do to kind of lobby or petition governments to try and promote sort of uh, clean air of cities and so forth? Well, well um, you can do it through your profession, uh, for a start. Uh, I think um, looking at, for example, is there provision for cycle, cycle uh, secure locks in the, in the buildings you design, so you can do it directly through that, uh, and through encouraging the users of your buildings to take um, different options. 
And then, you know, you know join Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. <laughs> Campaign that way. Sorry, just on that point, there is a consultation out currently from the Mayor of London that's open until the 18th of December, <coughs> available online, which anyone you can very specifically sign up to and put your views. Okay, yes, a uh, chap in the red uh, yeah. shirt. Uh, I'm Carl, I'm a pensioner, so I just ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, in terms of the map of the gases and particulate, particulate matter which we generate within England. And when we add on, on top of that, what we get from across the channel in Europe, are our measurements good enough? And have we been taken long enough to say like in a particular block, or maybe within 100 yards, we can say, look, you see all those houses there? You carry up the value or carry down the value. Um, as I tried to point out, um, you get these emissions from <coughs> various sources and they're different heights moving and you know, some may be 100 metres at the top of a stack. And this extends right across the UK and across Europe and indeed in the Northern Hemisphere there's pollutants measurable from China coming into Europe, especially as we've reduced our sulphur emissions, uh, for example. And the, if you try and measure how the pollutant moves in a street there, it may be quite different to the street there. The pollution concentration on that side of this building will be much higher than on the back side of the building. And so you get this very complex uh, fluid dynamics and chemistry uh, going on. So it's very difficult to be very specific uh, as, as to you know, exactly how you would, the concentration of pollutants that we have here in this building, for example, how they arise. Ah, but we have instruments which measure, and then we, we would have what we would call uh, dead areas where it would be, where pollution settles until something strong comes and blow it away. Well, so some, no area some things like particles are different chemically and physically, and you can have some idea what their sources are. Others, like nitrogen dioxide, is just a chemical bomb compound, and you can't tell where, where it comes from. But what they do when they're looking at um, air pollution policy in Europe, because as I showed you, this large travel transport, they use um, supercomputers modeling the whole atmosphere and saying, if you emit a tonne of NOx, in Berlin, then one kilogram arrives in London and two kilograms in Stockholm and so forth. And so there are these efforts to try and trace where emissions end up from one place to another. And the reason for that is because to come up with uh, policies for air quality across the whole of Europe, which is the scope you at least need to come into account, you need to know where best to control the emissions to have the best impact on improving air quality in cities or acid rain deposition in, in Europe. And so when you're looking at uh, European policy for air quality in cities and for emission ceilings for each country of these pollutants, they take into account this huge computer modeling to try and work out source and sink of, of, of the pollutants. Okay. Can I take a chunk of the um, So I'm Amadeus Heller from the Chemistry Department. Um, what role do you see for, I mean, with, with the discussion of, you know, stigmatizing or banning or this, you know, one of the key things is to make sure that people like you know about this stuff and are more aware of it. What role do you see for citizen science playing in all this? And actual kind of local measurements being done by community groups and that kind of stuff? Um, I would just say that if it's going to be citizen science, then it has to be good science. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, a lot of um, residents groups around the country where there's been an air quality issue have used what we call diffusion tubes, which is all tubes this size, and you put them out, you close them, expose them for four weeks, and you send them to a lab, and it tells you what concentration of nitrogen dioxide are. There's fairly good, well established protocols as to how you use these things, and the data is okay. It's indicative. It's indicative. Yeah. There's also various electronic bits of kit that are coming onto the market. And I have real problems with them because, um, so they're electrochemical sensors that can measure NO2 concentrations, but you've got interference from carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are these two orders of magnitude higher than the NO2. And unless you've got a lot of NO2 in the air, you're measuring mainly 
CO2, and so you get very high readings, but not of the right thing. So if people who don't understand about the interferences use these bits of kit, they're going to say, we've got a problem, we've got 60 microns a cubic meter we've measured, and it must be right because this piece of kit says it's right. But I know that probably it's wrong because it's mainly CO2, not the NO2. So that is my problem I have. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a scientist, so I think that things have to be robust. Citizen science is great. I think involving people is really, really important. But the data has got to be robust enough to have, it have some meaning. The fusion tube, I think we know enough about them that they do have meaning. These new electrical chemical sensors, I am on the genius. To add, to add to what says, perhaps a more accurate way is to encourage the development of a finer resolu spatial resolution public monitoring system, which we have already. And the citizen science thing is you, you put your postcode in and it tells you what the pollutant concentrations um, are outside. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, check shirt. Uh, that's Steve for um, chemical engineering at UCL. And my question really is about commercial vehicles. Um, I actually come into London on a motorbike and just pass stream, stream upon stream of stationary traffic, most of which really isn't cars. And your, um, the whole emphasis seems to be on consumer choice by taxing cars and car decisions. I mean, what's the guy who's running a heavy haulage business going to do? I mean, does he actually have an option other than choosing a large diesel engine? Well, I think that's partly um, why the focus has been on diesel cars, because there's the obvious, well, the obvious immediate choice on petrol car, or particularly in London, you have public transport or whatever. So, I, but I think um, so. Other sources of road transport, such as uh, HGVs or small vans, are also a particular problem. But I think they need other. I think tax options particularly can help, but I think it has to be has to be done in a way that's kind of a bit more politically feasible, you can't simply, there's the whole issue of pricing people out of business and that sort of thing. So I think you need to kind of balance that particularly more with... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the diesel engines are in large lorries because they're high torque. I mean, what are you going to replace them with? So, so you could actually well, replace all the, all the engines with... Them. Well, you can use electric van transport. It's quite feasible, plenty of range. There are even our electric trucks now, BMW make. But you can shift that. So if you use electric train to move your goods to the city and electric vans for distribution, this is quite a technically and economically feasible problem. I, I slightly differ from Paul, actually, um, because the turnover rate, for example, of vans is generally higher uh, than cars. And so the time aspect that uh, Claire is, uh, is, is mentioning. And also, of course, you can pass your costs on if you're commercial. And in fact, quite a high proportion of NOx is from diesel vans and trucks. Um, so, certainly heavy duty vehicles, the, the larger trucks, um, they've had the real world emissions requirements um, for a couple of years already. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the most recent you know, six heavy duty vehicles are performing significantly better than all the earlier vehicles. So there, there is, there is <coughs> new vehicles are not... <coughs> nearly as bad as the old ones. So. But is, is that because of tailpipe solutions yeah. or is that because the actual engines are more efficient? Or it's to do with the tailpipe solutions. Second so, so you can not quite to all these engines, really? Um, yes, there's, there's, there's issues. It only works when your, your exhaust temperature is at a certain level. If it's not at a certain level, then it doesn't work. Um, if you're idling, um, you need to turn your engine off because actually idling pushes air through the engine and it cools down the exhaust much quicker and so when you then turn on your engines you've got to get up to the heat again well, so you should turn off your engines because the engine is then takes longer to cool down there's all sorts of things that then maybe people need to be aware of um, so there's a public a huge public education um, need um, unfortunately our government's not very keen on um, any public education on this issue at the moment but maybe things will I'll change take one more short question stretch it yeah, in terms of um, oh, no. oh sorry, free jump, um, in terms of head impacts and adaptation of individuals actually that ties into the public education because I am um, I have read articles that there is great danger of air pollution in London for instance, but there's very little about what you can actually do about it. And then I've seen people cycling around with those masks, but then I've also read that it's mostly about the gases and not about the fine particles of the mask. Don't actually have what is there a rule of thumb when 
where you can like sort of recognize air pollution in London is really high and that's why you shouldn't cycle. Walk, walk as far as possible from the centre of the road <laughs> and, and cycle down back streets. Seriously, I mean, you know, just to Euston Road and say a back street around here will be very, very significant um, difference. But this is part of the problem, is that as an individual, you can only have an impact through collective action. There is an app that makes suggestions about which road you should use to um, avoid the high protein roads. There's also... Um, what is that called? Uh, it's King's College, London. There's also something called, I think it's Clean Space, where they're actually yep. giving out free um, air quality yeah, data collection devices to cyclists and people like that so that they can actually get a better idea of what's going on. I'd just like to raise one point, Bob, that Go we on. haven't discussed, and this is maybe for over wine. It's diesel engines emit less CO2 per kilometre than petrol engines. And so you may be reducing air pollution, but you're increasing sea level rise. <laughs> <laughs> Timescale is really important for both those issues, isn't it? Although, quickly to add to that, though, that problem is nowhere near as bad as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may, it, sa it sounds as though we do need to move this discussion upstairs now. So I would like to thank our three speakers. Uh, for <laughs>